I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. I'd only heard about you before, but now I've seen you with my own eyes. One of the great encouragements to me in the midst of such a strange time has been the clear evidence that none of this has caught God off guard. And we've seen this again and again, that God went before us. And it struck me this week that this is one of the ways that God is described in the Old Testament. He is the God who goes before you. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse eight, we read, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse two, this time it's God speaking and he speaks to his people and he says, I will go before you and level the mountains and I will break down the gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. And so just understand that there is no mountain so high that God cannot level it. And I understand that in this season, we look at, out at what's in front of us and it seems like it's just one mountain after another. And there's the mountain of financial insecurity or there are mountains of physical disease and national disunity. There's mountains of marriage strain and family tensions and job loss. And it's just one mountain after another in front of us. But we worship the God who goes before us and levels the mountains. It's not just that God gives us strength to overcome the mountains. It's not just that he gives us what we need to climb the mountain is that he levels the mountain. That we worship the God who is the way maker, the miracle worker, he's the curse reverser and he is the mountain leveler. And so we worship the God who has gone before us. That means he will never leave you, he will never forsake you. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. In January of uh, 2019, so almost a year and a half ago, you may remember that we packed uh, a million meals for people in need at our different campuses. We came together and, and we packed more than a million meals that were gonna go to three different places in the world where we had these needs. One of those places was Cuba. And we were gonna send several hundred thousand meals over to our ministries in Cuba. But between the time that we packed those meals as a church, and the time they were supposed to receive them, the relationship between the United States and Cuba changed. And as a result, we weren't allowed to release the food to our ministries there. And, and so for more than a year, that food was just sitting in a shipping container. And it was, uh, you know, it was just frustrating. It was discouraging. We've gone to this work and to this expense as a church. We wanted to take care of the people that God's given us the privilege of loving in Cuba and they were counting on that food. And so we prayed, God, release the food, allow it to go through, but it wasn't happening. And in my mind, like, why not? Why wouldn't God answer a prayer like that? I mean, does he not care? Or maybe he's not aware, maybe he just doesn't know. And so we spent a year telling God and we spent a year praying that God would release the food. And then in January of 2020, it's a few months ago, Several hundred thousand meals that we had packed in January of 2019 were finally released to our Cuban ministries. But don't miss the timing of this because it turns out that the food was held for a year and then released just in time to meet one of the most significant food shortages that Cuba has experienced due to COVID-19. So for the last year, it may have seemed like God didn't care. It may have seemed like God didn't know. God knew. In fact, it turns out that we're the ones who didn't know. And sometimes we ask God for something based on what we think we know, and God says no. And we don't understand because we think if he knew what we know, then he wouldn't say no. But it turns out that we often don't know what we don't know. And sometimes he says no because he knows what we don't. 
And once again, we discover that we worship God. And the God we worship is not the God who is running late. He is the God who goes before. So in the book of Job that we've been looking at together, Job wants to know that God knows. In fact, as I read through the book of Job from beginning to end, something that struck me is that Job's main complaint against God is not God's lack of control. It's not that God doesn't care. His main complaint against God is his awareness. Like Job's just not sure that God realizes what's happening. And so the message that Job seems to be trying to get through to God is, God, can you see this? If, if I could just get the right information in front of him, if I could just make him aware of what was going on in my life. And he, he wants to make sure that God knows, that God knows that he's lost his business and his family and his health and his body is falling apart. In fact, we read in the book of Job that Job had these painful sores that covered him from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. And Job describes what he's going through a little bit more poetically in chapter 30, verse 27. Here's what Job says. He writes, the churning inside me never stops. Days of suffering confront me. In other words, there's just no end to this. He writes, I go about blackened, but not by the sun. I stand up in the assembly and I cry for help. In other words, he says, there's nowhere I can go. There's nowhere left to turn. He writes, I've become a brother to jackals and a companion to, the, to owls. I can't sleep at night. My skin grows black and peels and my body burns with fever. He writes, and then in verse 31, he says, my harp is tuned to mourning and my flute to the sound of wailing. God, do you know? Can, can you hear the sound of my life? It's tuned to mourning, it's tuned to wailing. And Job wants to know, God, can you hear that? Do you know? In the midst of this crisis, I hear every day from people who are struggling and are afraid and they're desperate and weren't ready for this and they're not sure what they're gonna do. And they've lost jobs and they've watched uh, their plans for the future kind of fall apart around them and they just feel overwhelmed. And I know that, that describes many of you right now. Like I know, I know that many of you are hurting, but does God know? As a pastor, one of the places where this uh, question has echoed the loudest in my prayers are for the families in our church who've lost loved ones during this time. So I, I wanna introduce you to three different families in our church who have been grieving the loss of someone they love, but they've also been stripped of the comfort of a funeral and the loving embrace of friends and family. So we want them to know as a church, we love you, we care about you. So you're gonna be introduced to the loved ones of three people who've passed away during this strange season. Three people who've passed away, Mrs. Newt, Mary Anderson, and one of my biggest personal encouragers over the years, Ken Towery. Mom was the matriarch of our family. Uh, she was an extremely strong person. She was very grounded in, um, in her faith. She also kept the family together. Um, you know, having an alcoholic father, you would have thought we would have all gone our own different ways, or many of us, but we didn't. She maintained a real strong family unit. Mary was a beautiful woman, um, in inside and outside. She was always smiling and asking if you needed anything. And Mary was always so thoughtful. I like licorice, and so every time I'd go visit, Mary had would have gone a few days earlier to all kinds of different stores and find exotic licorices and have them there for me to try. Ken was just full of life. We just were together all the time. We enjoyed dancing, we enjoyed boating. He would always say to me, I just love life. Don't you love life? 
Ken had prostate cancer. The doctor called us uh, into his office and he said, um, I have bad news. You have multiple tumors in both lungs. They did an MRI and that's when we learned that he also had seven tumors in his brain. And we were just shocked. Mary had a problem that we didn't know about and that Brett didn't even know about until he saw her one day and said, Mary, the side of your face is swollen. And she said, oh yeah, I know. I think maybe I might have a swollen lymph gland. But he called us and said that EMS had come and that they had taken Mary to the hospital. And of course, all of this was with the coronavirus already in place. And then the next morning, Brett called and we were just shocked that he said Mary died. When they confirmed on a Friday that my mom had the coronavirus, the doctors had called. And that evening, uh, they told us that um, her organs were gonna start shutting down. The administrator called up again and she said, we're not gonna allow all of you to go up now. So then I went down and I told my siblings that mom was ready to go. The nurses graciously let every single one of them FaceTime with mom. About 6.30 in the morning, the nurse uh, removed her mask and held my mom's hand. And uh, within probably less than a minute, she said she's gone. So we just spent a little time with him and then we um, called the service to come and, and get him. And um, they kept asking me, do you want to go wait in another room? And I said, no, I want to be with him. I just didn't want to see him go. I wanted to be with Brett and to comfort him and, and help him with just all the things that had to be taken care of. As a parent and a father, you want, you want to, sometimes not even so much just to say anything, but just to be there. And that was kind of not possible at the moment. Mary's not in our life anymore. We'll never be able to see her again and we can't even have a funeral. Ken was so well-loved and well-respected in the community, but I felt bad for Ken because I just felt like he deserved so much more. He deserved a, a lot of people coming to say goodbye to him. God, do you know about that? Do you know? The word know in scripture is a word that communicates deep understanding and intimate knowledge. Whenever you um, study the meaning of a word in scripture, one of the first things you wanna do is you wanna look back and you wanna read it the first time it's used. And if you look at the word know in scripture, the first time it's used is in Genesis chapter four, verse one. And it's in the context of a relationship between Adam and Eve, between a husband and wife. And it says in Genesis 4, verse 1, King James Version says, Adam knew his wife Eve. He knew his wife. If you pull out your Hebrew dictionary, that word there, some version of it, the meaning would be to know completely and to be completely known. The NIV translates that word a little bit differently in Genesis 4 verse 1 because it puts it in the context of what's happening. And Genesis 4 verse 1 says, Adam lay with his wife. And so that's the word for know, it's yada. To know completely and to be completely known. It's this intimate connecting on every level. Now here's what's really interesting. If you read through scripture and you just trace the word yada through the Old Testament, what you'll find is that over and over again, this word also describes the relationship God wants to have with us. Over and over again, it's yada. It's a, it's a word that communicates that God knows you completely. There's a passage of scripture in Psalm 139 where David uses the word no or yada six times to describe how God knows us. And in a very short passage, Psalm 139, David says, O Lord, you have examined my heart and you know, you know everything about me. 
and you know when I sit down or when I stand up and you know my thoughts even from afar. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know, yada, you know everything I do. You know what I'm gonna say before I even say it, Lord. I suppose there's a sense in which when you hear that, depending on your relationship with God, that could be a pretty terrifying that God knows everything you say and do. But when David speaks these words, he's not speaking words of fear. He's speaking words of comfort. God, you know how I feel and you know how I hurt and you know what I'm going through. None of it has escaped you. And when you are hurting and when you're struggling, when you're anxious and uncertain, I think there is great comfort in knowing that God knows. And that's what I want you to know this weekend that when we are surrounded by the unknown, we can find comfort in knowing that God knows. You see this kind of, uh, you see this kind of knowing between a mother and a baby. Like when a baby is born, of course, a baby cries and cries. I remember when my kids were babies and they would start crying. I never knew what was wrong. Like I would try everything. I'd give them a bottle, try and feed them, change the diaper. 38 seconds flat, it's my best time. You can try and beat it if you want. I, I would even at some time, I mean, if it was really desperate, at some time, sometimes I would change the channel from Sports Center to Teletubbies. And if, you know, young parents, if you don't know what Teletubbies are, do not Google that stuff. Like once you watch Teletubbies, you can't unwatch it. But I was willing to watch it just to try to keep the baby from crying. I didn't know what to do. But my wife, I mean, she just knew. She seemed to just know what the baby needed. And so my wife would hear one cry and she would say, oh, she's tired. Sure enough, she'd lay her down for a nap. The baby would be fine. She'd hear another cry and my wife would say, oh, she's hungry and give her food to eat. And she'd stop crying. She'd hear another cry and say, oh, she needs her diaper changed and, and she wants her daddy to change it. I'm like, are you sure that's what that means? Like, uh, are you sure that's what she's crying, saying? But I didn't know. I couldn't argue with her. I didn't know, but my wife just seemed to know. And when we had our first baby girl, she'd start crying, I'd pick her up. And it seemed like she'd just cry louder, but mama picked her up and the cries would grow quieter. I just think she knew that mama knew. There is something calming and comforting about the presence of someone who you know knows.